Greetings, Berkshire County, and thank you for joining us on iBerkshire's TV. Jeff Sununian here. Today, uh, very pleased to be joined by the new interim police chief in Adams, Massachusetts, Troy Bacon. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us. Uh, I can't imagine it's been, you probably haven't had a second or two to even, uh, it's been hectic, let's say that, I'm sure. Uh, and you come to us all the way uh, from Frankfort, Indiana, Indiana, born and raised. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience there. 20 years on the force, left as the chief. Um, Tell us a little bit about Frankfurt, Indiana. Well, sure. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, Frankfurt, Indiana is about 40 minutes north of Indianapolis and about 20 minutes south of Lafayette, West Lafayette, where Purdue University is, about the five miles east of Interstate 65. Uh, it's, it's a heavy uh, industrial community. Uh, there is uh, lots of blue collar, good people who live there. It's a diverse community, about 30% Hispanic. and uh, Lots of uh, rural uh, cornfields and bean fields around, but we have some pretty pretty large factories there. Um, I think it, I think Frankfurt hosts the largest free to lay uh, plant I think oh, in, the, yeah. in the in the world. I think it's just getting ready to have a re renovation, and I think when that expansion happens, it'll be the largest in the world. But uh, it's a nice community. You should come come visit. We have an annual have an annual festival called the Hot Dog Festival, oh. and uh, it would be actually going on this coming weekend, I think. But because of COVID, it, it all got canceled this year. Next year, I, I very well may be at the Hot Dog Festival. It's my favorite food, and uh, that actually <laughs> sounds fantastic. It doesn't sound too dissimilar to our region here. You have maybe, uh, although a little closer to a big city in Indianapolis, but you have a couple of major employers and stuff like that, and at least the research I did, uh, demographically kind of the same. Um, it's a city, but it's not a, it's not a huge city. Um, right. What sort of, and again, you, you started your career there, you rose to chief, and somehow, somewhere, I think you were hiking that, the Appalachian Trail last year, I heard, coincidentally yeah. enough. Um, yes. How have your experience in Frankfurt, what can you take from there, and even in this short time, um, maybe implement here? How, how would you, how could Adams benefit um, from stuff that you've seen in the Midwest and Frankfurt, Indiana? Well, when I started in 1998, um, it was an inter interesting time, especially in the early 2000s. We had a lot of uh, gang violence, a lot of violence, a lot of shootings and stabbings. And that really came to head in about 2005, I think, 2005 or 2006, where uh, I, was, uh, I was a victim of a drive-by shooting uh, while I was on duty. And uh, my car got shot up, caught on fire. We ended up catching the individuals responsible and they all went to prison. And everyone who was in that car that night, that there were five people in the car that shot at me at the same time. They all went to prison, and that really put a big dent on the, uh, the, gang, uh, the gang influence in, in that community. And uh, from that point on, it kind of uh, leveled out. And then in about 2011, 2012, we started to see uh, crime kind of come to a head. Um, it was starting to increase quite a bit, and uh, there were really no processes in place to deal with it. And when I became chief of police, one of the first things we did right away is engage the community, try to bridge that gap, try to um, create an understanding that the police and the community should work together. And when we do so, we can problem solve together and solve major issues such as crime. And we were able to do that. And um, I think the last, the last statistics that I, that I ran before I left was there was about a 30% increase or decrease, I'm sorry, decrease in crime since 2012. And I think a lot of that is in part because of the relationships that we had with our community. Frankfurt also has uh, interesting demographics where it's about 27, 30% uh, Hispanic. And we had some challenges there as well because of the distrust that the Hispanic and Latino community have in our police departments. And, and what we did is immediately start reaching out to that demographic, had community meetings in Spanish, at uh, locations such as churches and things like that. And um, those really paid off. Those, those started to work. Um, uh, we, we were able to recruit better. We were able to diversify our department. We were, able to his we were able to hire some Hispanic and Latino officers because of those connections that we made. We, we brought on board a, a Hispanic uh, chaplain, Pastor Leo Gonzalez, loved the guy to death. He was a former police officer in Mexico. So he got it. He got what we, the challenges that we were facing and knew the, the problems of distrust in the community. He was, he was a pretty strong advocate. But, um, you know, just 
Another thing I think, not only is the community aspect that I bring to Adams, but you know, one of the things that I think is, is really important is to be able to work as a team, develop a, a plan of direction that you want the department to go, work with the community to also develop that plan and, and go and, and, and implement it. Um, you're just spinning your wheels if you don't have an idea of where you're going. And collaboratively with the community, I plan on coming up with a plan that will hopefully move Adams uh, uh, into the future and we can, we can have some successes. And it's, it's interesting, you're talking about community policing, that's long been a push and pull here in Adams. Um, you know, this being, it, it's not a rich, it, we're not a wealthy community, we can't just throw money around like, like some others in, in the Berkshires are, are fortunate enough to do. So community policing uh, is a commitment that you need to stick to on a consistent basis, it sounds like something that you believe. But of course, once the budget gets tight, you're not going to cut your regular shifts and you're not going to cut, you're, you're going to cut sort of the marginal things, which is community policing. So it's a tough push and pull. But here's the thing, community policing isn't just having a, a meeting at the park. It's, it's a philosophy. And you, you ingrain that philosophy, not only in the way you conduct your business on patrol or me as a chief of police, but you also do it in policy. Just because a budget potentially could get cut, yeah, we may, we may have to back off some of the meetings that we may have, but you can still engage the community while you're on patrol. A one-on-one -on -one meeting, if I'm on patrol and I see you, when we start talking, that's community policing. That's understanding what your needs are, talking with me and me bringing that back to my, the chief or to the sergeants or whatever, implementing a plan to fix that. It's not just a meeting. So there's ways around that. And I hope to, to be able to develop that here. And, and certainly, what would you see as the genesis? Because if I think of Frankfurt, Indiana, it's 20 minutes north of Indianapolis. I've been kind of throughout the Midwest pretty well. And it seems like everything's down home and it's wonderful. And, but, but you mentioned some serious problems. What would the genesis be of the gang-related activity? Is it simply lack of jobs? Is it idle time? Is it, where do these things spring from when you think of a, a little Midwestern town in Indianapolis and you've got these major problems there? Well, is it, can it sure. be that simple, actually? It's, I don't know that it's that simple, but um, I think on, on a basic level, it, was, it just started with a bunch of guys hanging out hmm. and met the, met the wrong people and got involved in drugs and, 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 um, and, and weapons and really started intimidating communities. And for whatever reason, other, gang, other gangs came in. We had the Latin Kings, the Sur 13s. Those were the two biggest ones that we had. And then, of course, they start fighting. And then you've got gunfire, crossfire, houses are getting hit. But I don't know if there was one major source. I think it might have just been people got together and met the people or met the right people or wrong people, however you look at it, and uh, started doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And it just escalated. Yeah, sometimes all the sociologists in the world, you can study it all you want. Sometimes it might be a few guys who start things up. And we, we certainly do have some of these problems here. Um, uh, what's, what's your, if let's say you're the interim police chief, I think you're here at the very least until the end of 2020. Um, what are a couple of things? Have you latched onto a couple of things right now where you said, even if I'm only here until December, these are a couple of things that I want to get done. One is policy. Um, I want to, to overhaul policy. It hasn't been done for a while and really get the policies up to a best practice standard to reflect 21st century policing. Yeah, that, that's, that's a priority for me. And another one is to develop a um, strategic plan. Where, where are we going to go? Um, I think regardless if I'm here in 2021 or not, um, there'll be a good plan, a good solid plan that's already established if the other chief of police wants to, to move forward with it. And I think third is, is really community policing. But um, kind of like when I talked to someone the other day, it's the whole COVID situation is really Put a, put a major dent in what we're able to do. I think that's starting to get better, hopefully, but um, I think we just have to challenge ourselves to be creative and encourage officers to make those, uh, those connections with, with people on the street that they see. And uh, I guess if I had to kind of think about the things that I would be doing right now, those are the top three. And there, there's recently been, along with Chief Tarza, after 36 years he retired, you've recently kind of had an exodus here uh, of a lot of institutional knowledge 
of not only the police force, but the area in general, its citizens in general. You have a relatively young force right now. Um, positive, negative, neither opportunity? You know, it, it's really not much different than my, my past agency. We, we were a really young police department. I think I hired over half of our department. Um, so so the, the young aspect is I'm very familiar with, does present some challenges. I think we can overcome those by, by training and really uh, um, still having those connections with the officers that did retire. I know they, they still want to be involved and some of them will be. Uh, officer Dean and Officer Tar, so they're going to be special officers here. So they will they will still have that knowledge. Lieutenant Briggs will still have that knowledge that we can call. But I think it's 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 going to be a challenge, but I think we'll get through it. And I think Adams is well, I'm confident Adams is going to be okay. Uh, I, I think it's as far as I could tell, and I've talked to a couple of the the ex one ex chief and another local ex chief, but resident. I am fa we're fairly certain you're the only guy who's not been from Adams who was acting even interim as as police chief in Adams, which if if uh, it's difficult. Uh, we haven't hired a lot of people from the outside, so to speak. I think it's a breath of fresh air. Um, uh, I know. We're lucky to have you, even though I'm, your family's back home doing their thing. And how about uh, personally wise, uh, if, if if just from Indiana, give us a little bit of your background, um, your family, if, if you care to, but you're here for six months and Adam's trying to work with us. It's incredible. We'll talk about a little bit of your, your uh, uh, what's going on back home. So I have a, a wife, Annie, and I have three daughters, two of which are teachers. Wow. Uh, my youngest daughter, she's 14, so she'll be going in her freshman year this is this coming year so and I have two cats PB and J <laughs> and they're getting along fine well I, I, I know that the interview process uh, they, they didn't mention anybody by name uh, but they kept talking about this one candidate that was really shining so I think we're lucky to have you um, and I think I think you've got a task ahead of you you know we, we're all aware of what's going on right now nationally with with police in the community there's a ton of mistrust um, but it's gonna start at little places like Adams and it, it can mushroom from there and it, it, it can go out from there because we all know our police officers so well. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it, it's got to start somewhere. And if it doesn't start locally, it's not going to um, right. ha have you one last question, actually, because this is something I've been worried about. It, you know, a lot of people comment now that it's, not, it's People say, "Geez, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be a police. I wouldn't go to the police academy today. You couldn't. You, you couldn't pay me enough to be a cop today." H has there been any effect? You know, in police academies, it, are the applications down? You're about to hire, or, or the department is about to hire, needs to hire a few new officers. Uh, has it been tough? Have you talked to some of your colleagues saying, "Man, we can't get people to apply"? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cor you know, back in Indiana, the, the police academies are full. Um, we're able to find people. It's just the, the applications that we once got aren't coming in as, as hefty as they were. And, you know, there's a lot of concerns that people, you know, you, you're a 23 year old, 22 year old um, who's, who's considering law enforcement. And then because you want to protect your community, you want to do right, you want to serve, but yet you see what's happening on TV. You, you read what's in the paper or you hear people talking on the street. That's, that's pretty disheartening. And it, it makes people question whether or not they want to get into law enforcement when they can, they can choose a career path that relatively has good benefits and pays about the same and, and not have to deal with everything that a, a police officer has to deal with today. But there are still good men and women out there who have a good heart that want to do it for the right reasons and are willing to, to withstand the pressure to ensure that their communities are safe, um, that their communities are protected and are served correctly. So, I think it's going to get better. I do. It, we're just in a wall right now. And there's, but I have no doubt in that. But some of my colleagues in some of the larger cities around uh, Frankfurt that I've, and even Frankfurt too, um, you know, when we started application processes back in about 2015, 2013, we were getting six, 60 applicants. Wow. And uh, when I left, we were getting close to maybe 15. Um, so there, there has been a, a dramatic effect. And that wasn't just Frankfurt. That was everywhere. City of Lafayette, Indiana, has got close to 100,000 people who live there. They were only getting 10 applicants wow. or applications. They were only getting 15 applications. That's, that's pretty concerning. And it should be concerning to everyone, not just police departments. It should be. And I, I think maybe in a little bit of a silver lining, it might be that 
the people who you get applying to be police today really want to do that. That's their life. That's their calling. They're not just seeing it as an option or, well, it's okay. And I'll kind of, the, I think the people who you're going to get now are absolutely 100% behind going into law enforcement. And maybe that's a I would, silver lining. I would agree with that. And I would say that the, the quality of applicant that becomes a police officer today, um, they're good applicants. Um, it's not like people who are applying today aren't good applicants or they're, they're average. We're still getting really good, talented police officers. So the public, they should know that, that we're not settling for anything. That we're getting really, really good applicants, just not as many of them. Chief, I wish, I mean, we could do this for an hour, or at least I could, but uh, thank you very much. I, I mean, I, you've got a million things to do, and I thank you enough for your, your time here, and I can't, I wish you the best of luck. I mean, we're, we, it's, it's a huge part of the Adams experience is that small town force, and it goes mm -hmm. for everything. It goes for our volunteer firefighters. It is such a huge part of who we are here that it's important that we have a strong police force going in a positive direction. Uh, I, and I, I, think, uh, I think you've got a task ahead of you. I think it's been good. Um, but I have no doubt that you and the boys, are, you and the boys and women down there are going to get things done. Um, if there's anything that anybody can do to help, come out in community police and ask us. We will volunteer. It's one thing about Adams. There are no shortage of volunteers. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on iVirtues TV.